Hi uh, guys, this should be Wednesday, May 13th. We are continuing to learn about inferencing. You should have been watching some videos on Monday and Tuesday about how to make inferences as you uh, read or even as you look at things that have occurred. So today we're going to continue to look at that, we'll look at a book that we've read before and see how we can use the skill of in inferring as we read. We'll begin with some prayer. So let's bow our heads. Heavenly Father, we do praise your name. We thank you that you are a gracious Father who loves his children, Lord, and that we can come to you in prayer. Lord, we ask forgiveness for the times that we have stepped outside your will, when we have sinned and done what we want instead of what you want. Lord, as we make this request, we know that you have forgiven us, Lord, and we pray that we will listen for your voice and your direction in the days and weeks ahead. And we pray these things in your name. Amen. All right. So today what we're going to do is read a book that you have read before, or that I have read to you before. This time we're going to look at it in a different way. Um, but it should be easy to be able to do that because we have read the book. Once again, I want to remind you that we are going to ask questions before, during, and after reading to enhance comprehension. Over here, just as a reminder about implement inference, infer or I infer when I think about what is probably true in a text, even though the author doesn't say it. And down here, how do I infer? Well, you infer when you take something you already know, what we call prior knowledge, what I know. You combine it with clues or pictures that are in the book or in the text that you're reading, and then you come up with what is probably true. Sometimes you're not always right, but generally you'll find that there's enough to make your conclusions that you're drawing the decisions that you're making about text accurate. So, we read this book before, if you um, had an opportunity to watch that video called Anansi and the Moss-Covered Rock. Uh, to ask questions before we read, we look at the, the cover, we see the spider, Anansi is the spider. We see this rock, we see a hippo kind of leaning over and looking at the rock. So, I know if you've heard the book before, you already know. But if you haven't, you might infer that the hippo looking at this rock is important. You can infer the fact that the spider is standing nearby, that that is also an important part of what's going on. And it does mention the moss-covered rock. So there must be something about that. So we'll go ahead and try and read through this. A Nancy and the Moss-Covered Rock retold by Eric A. Kimmel, and it was retold because it was originally a like a legend, a story that was passed down from generation to generation, and somebody finally decided to write it down. It's illustrated by Janet Stevens. Well, I did want to point out this picture here. We can infer that this is a Nancy's home because we see the spider web there. Once upon a time, a Nancy the spider was walking, walking, walking through the forest when something caught his eye. It was a strange moss-covered rock. How interesting, a Nancy said. Isn't this a strange moss-covered rock? Now, I do want to point something out here. So we can infer that there's something important about that character watching. Okay. So Anansi makes this statement, Kapam! Everything went dark. Down fell Anansi, senseless. Hmm. So something happened to him. We can infer that something occurred there. We're not quite sure what, but we can infer that something caused him to fall over and black out. An hour later, Anansi woke up. His head was spinning. He wondered what had happened, just like us. He was walking, I was walking along the path when something caught my eye. I stopped and said, isn't this a strange moss-covered rock? Oh. 
Down fell Anansi again, but this time, when he woke up an hour later, he knew what was happening. So Anansi is making an inference here. Aha, said Anansi, this is a magic rock, and whenever anyone comes along and says the magic words, isn't this a strange... Now he's going to be careful because he's already made the inference. Mm -mm 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 -mm. Down he goes. This is a good thing to know, said Anansi, and I know just how to use it. Okay. We could predict what he's going to do with that knowledge. And if you've heard the book before, you already kind of know. But we can infer that he's going to use this, this magic rock to do something based on what he said. So Anansi went walking, walking, walking through the forest until he came to Lion's house. Lion was sitting on his porch. At his feet was a great pile of yams. Anansi loved yams, but he was too lazy to dig them up himself. So if he loves the lambs, yams and he's too lazy to pick, dig them up himself, what do you think he's going to do? Hello, Lion. It is very hot today. Don't you think so? Yes, Anansi, said Lion. It is terribly hot. I am going for a walk in the cool forest, said Anansi. Would you like to come? I certainly would, said Lion. So what can we infer about him taking Lion for a walk in the forest? We can predict what might happen. So Lion and Anansi went walking, walking, walking through the forest. After a while, Anansi led Lion to a certain place. Can you infer what that place might be? Lion, do you see what I see? Oh, yes, Anansi, said Lion. Isn't this a strange moss-covered rock? Can you predict what happened? Kapam! Down fell Lion. Anansi ran back to Lion's house and made off with Lion's yams. Once, once more to be careful. Do you see that there? Okay. What can you predict or infer would happen next? An hour later, Lion woke up. His head was spinning. Anansi was nowhere in sight. And when he got home, he found that every single one of his yams was gone. Lion was very sad. We can infer that Lion didn't understand exactly what happened, because at no point did it did Anansi indicate he was taking his yams. But Anansi was very happy. He couldn't wait to play his trick again. Once more, Anansi went walking, walking, walking through the forest. This time, he stopped at Elephant's house. Elephant was sitting on his porch. At Elephant's feet was a great pile of bananas. Anansi loved bananas, and I bet you already know what the next part's going to say, but he was too lazy to pick them himself. So he said to Elephant, hello, Elephant, isn't it hot today? It is, Elephant agreed. I am going for a walk in the cool forest, Anansi said. Would you like to come? That sounds nice, said Elephant. Thank you for inviting me, Anansi. So Anansi and the Elephant went walking, walking through the forest. After a while, Anansi led Elephant to a certain place. You know what that would be? Elephant, look, do you see what I see? Elephant looked. Yes, I do, Anansi. Isn't that a strange moss-covered rock? On. Down fell Elephant. Anansi ran back to Elephant's house, and what do you think he did? He made off with all the bananas. I want you to notice back there and over there. An hour later, Elephant woke up. His head was spinning. Anansi was nowhere in sight, and when he got home, he found that every single one of his bananas was gone. Elephant was very sad, but he didn't know what had happened. So we can infer that there's something important about that deer being in all those pictures. 
but Anansi was very happy. He couldn't wait to play his trick again. He played it on rhinoceros and hippopotamus. He played it on giraffe and zebra. He played it on every single animal in the forest. And though we cannot see the events that came before, we can infer that each one of these animals had something that Anansi wanted, that he led them to the rock and they all said the magic words. So can we predict what might happen next? But all the time, watching from behind the leaves was Little Bush Deer. Little Bush Deer is small and shy and very hard to see. She watched Anansi play his wicked trick again and again on all the other animals. Little Bush Deer decided it was time for Nancy to learn a lesson. Let's think about this. What lesson does he need to learn? Does he need to learn to be kind? Does he need to learn not to trick his friends? Does he need to learn not to take their things? So little bush deer went deep into the forest to where the coconut trees grow. She climbed a coconut tree and threw down a great many coconuts. She carried the coconuts home in a basket and set them on her porch. Then she sat down beside them to wait. So we can infer that she picked all those coconuts because she wanted to use them to trick an answer. There's little bush deer. In a little while, along came Anansi. Anansi's eyes lit up when he saw little bush deer's coconuts. We know what's going to come next. Anansi loved coconuts. He loved to eat the tender white coconut meat and drink the sweet coconut milk inside but he was much too lazy to gather coconuts himself. Instead, he said, hello, little bush deer. It is so hot today. Little D bush deer smiled. It is very hot, Anansi. I am going for a walk in the cool forest. Would you like to come? Yes, I would, said little bush deer. So Anansi and little bush deer went walking, walking, walking in the cool forest. After a while, Anansi led Little Bush Deer to a certain place. Little Bush Deer, look over there. Do you see what I see? Now, notice where Little Bush Deer is looking. She's looking up. So we can infer that she is trying not to look at what Anansi is trying to direct her attention to. You see Anansi right there. Little Bush Deer knew all about Anansi's trick. She looked. No, Anansi, I don't see anything. You must see it. Look very carefully. Little Bush Deer looked. No, I still don't see anything, she said. Anansi began to get angry. You must see it. Look over here. Look, right where I'm pointing. Do you see it now? No, Anansi, said Little Bush Deer. Anansi stamped his legs. You see it. You just don't want to say it. So what do you think is going to happen? We can infer that Little Bush Deer is trying to force Anansi to say the magic words with the way she's acting. Say what, said Little Bush Deer? You know... Is that what I'm supposed to say? Yes, said a Nancy. And a Nancy thinks that she's going to say the sentence. All right, then. I will say it to make you happy. You know, said Little Bush Deer. There, I said it. Are you satisfied? No, a Nancy shouted. You're not just supposed to say, you know. What am I supposed to say? You're supposed to say, isn't this a strange moss-covered rock? Come on, down fell Anansi. So can we predict what's going to happen? Little bush deer didn't lose her coconuts to Anansi. Anansi is passed out. Little bush deer ran and got all the other animals. Together, they went to Anansi's house and took back all the good things he had stolen from them. So there's the yams and the bananas, and we see melon, 
we see some pineapple, or, um, oranges, lemons. So can we predict what's going to happen? Can we infer that Nancy, uh, Nancy has learned his lesson? An hour later, Anansi woke up. His head was spinning. Little bush deer was nowhere in sight. And when he got home, he found his house was empty, as it was before. But if you think Anansi learned his lesson, you're mistaken, because he's still playing tricks to this very day. So the end of the book actually allows us to infer something more, because it suggests that Anansi is still playing tricks. So we can make some inference about what kind of tricks he's playing. Is it possible he's continuing to use that moss-covered rock? Well, I would infer that he is not, because all of the animals know just how that trick works. So it wouldn't work again. But there are other tricks that a Nazi could do, and that's where other stories about a Nazi come from. All right, my friends, that's enough inference for today. I'll have another inf inference video for tomorrow. Bye.